The Life Extension Foundation's initial mission was to fund research aimed at achieving physical immortality. Regrettably, the FDA got on our way. They were interfering with certain scientists who were doing research projects that were very, very critical. They were interfering with the ability of our members to access documented anti-aging therapies. They even came in and raided our facilities several times and seized all of the supplements that we were offering. So we were forced to go to war with the FDA. Since then, we have won numerous victories in court. We've protected the First Amendment right for supplement companies to tell the truth to the public about what dietary supplements may really do. Probably our biggest victory was getting enough uh, supplement users in the United States. We're talking about literally millions and millions of Americans to write letters to Congress, to fax Congress, to call Congress, and demand in 1994 that the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act be passed. And that was passed by an overwhelming majority. And that single act has resulted in more dietary supplements being available than ever before at lower prices and, and significant innovations in this unregulated area of, of health care, as opposed to the regulated prescription drug market where you don't have a lot of innovation, you get a lot of side effects, a lot of deaths, and very high prices. We evaluate all of the published scientific literature and then we reduce that into a lay format for publication into our 110 page monthly magazine called Life Extension Magazine. We also summarize all of our findings into a 1600 page book called Disease Prevention and Treatment. And we make that book available every other year to our members and that essentially summarizes the best scientific methods of treating or preventing 129 diseases that the medical community has overlooked. The, the, these ways that are documented in scientific studies that are not being applied in clinical medical settings. The prospect of human life extension is being discussed by leaders around the world. While addressing the 8th annual Millennium Evening at the White House in 1999, President Clinton stated, we want to live forever and we're getting there. He also added that we've treated the Human Genome Project like a priority every year because we all want to live forever. A few business and business leaders are beginning to fund aging research. Larry Ellison, chief executive of Oracle, has contributed more than $20 million per year for aging research. In 2001, Larry Ellison said, Death has never made any sense to me. How can a person be there and then just vanish, just not be there? Death makes me very angry. Premature death makes me angrier still. The cradle rocks above an abyss. And common sense tells us that our existence is but a brief crack of light between two eternities of darkness. Nature expects a full-grown man to accept the two black voids fore and aft as stolidly as he accepts the extraordinary visions in between. Imagination, the supreme delight of the immortal and the immature, should be limited. In order to enjoy life, we should not enjoy it too much. I rebel against this state of affairs. Vladimir Nabokov. You don't say, well, I'm going to die, therefore life must not be all that good. You say, I'm going to die, this is absolutely horrible, and then you keep your brain in that mode. You don't go shifting around to say, what, you don't look for consolations. You're not supposed to be consoled. You're going to die. It's horrible. You should do something about it. Uh, the reality is most of us kind of ignore, ignore that big elephant in the living room and pretend that uh, we're not heading rapidly toward aging and death. Um, the very few right now, percent on a percentage basis, are taking the extremely rational step of saying, well, cryonics may not be a guarantee, but it's certainly the most rational, scientifically valid thing I can do right now to perhaps beat the reaper. I mean, I've talked about that with the children some. I mean, uh, sometimes when they're going to sleep, you know, a little kid like the five-year-old, I mean, he'll just get, have an emotional reaction. And he'll actually cry about, you know, I don't want to die. And I mean, just what is death? And I mean, I, I very much think that uh, some of the world's religions, I mean, that's uh, kind of an answer. I do have some relatives who don't understand. Some of my friends not so much friends as acquaintances, um, work colleagues, and so on, generally don't think, if they don't think that living longer is better, it's because they are looking forward to an afterlife that is going to be better. And 
I'm not going to say for sure that there isn't one, but I don't know for sure that there is. And I know that there's this life because I'm living it. Oh, that's a hard a uh, question to answer. You know, because I'm a, I'm a researcher and ev pretty much everything I do is based on facts or um, any of the kind of predictions I make is sort of based on what I see. And I don't know that we can say anything about what happens after death because no one knows. We can't go there and look. I mean, you can't go and look and see that there's nothing. And you can't go and look and see that there is something. Um, so, you know, given that we don't know, I just tend to, tend to not think about it very much. Um, mind you, I think that there is an interesting question that comes up is if we can, you know, in that if we can live forever, what does that say about God? What does that say about our conception of God? Does God exist? You know, are we, um, are we God's sibling now? Well, there's no evidence that, you know, we actually, our consciousness exists after we die. So, um, I think the people that say that, or people that object to the no that notion, are in some kind of denial that that's the reality of the situation. And if you look at it objectively, you know, um, there really is no, no evidence of, you know, any existence outside of this one.